Next one. <laughs> What? Someone. <laughs>
So I try to grow there, but it's just fan pleasing. I don't take my YouTube channel as an income or I don't need to push it that much anymore. Okay. Actually now it's some kind of hobby for you. Yeah, it's a hobby. Like so whenever I have the time, uh, I put a video on and then I get comments. He's back. I was never gone. <laughs> I'm just, I just upload a video maybe every third month or sometimes it's half year nothing. Mm -hmm. True. You know? But back in the days I had no band. I was just focusing on this. You know, making cover videos until they started to delete them because of copyright issues. Copyright issues, yeah. yeah. Okay, but important takeaway, well-known bands still do check YouTube videos. So it's yeah, a good it. idea to get your stuff out there, record videos, upload them. Of course, maybe you're going to get some hate as well, but still just do it. Go for it and give it a try. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Question number one. Next one, now we're going to talk a bit about drum gear, especially the drum gear you used when you first started out. Mm -hmm. Which double bass pedal would you recommend for someone who is just starting out and which one did you use back in the days? I would recommend Iron Cobra mm -hmm. because I've used the majority, I used Iron Cobras and I think it's a great pedal for every situation. It has a double chain so it's very sturdy. It's affordable still, so we're not talking about a direct drive pedal for a thousand euro and more. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of pedals out there, so if something gets broken, you can fix it easy. And it's a great all-round pedal. People play fast on this, people play also slow with this, and it works in, in mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, but I remember I started playing drums on a different pedal. It was the single chain, it was a single chain pedal from Pearl. Ah, okay. But I don't remember the number. But it was probably like one of the earlier models with a single chain. Yeah, so yeah. it was kind of easy to play, but it was very wobbly. Okay. Yeah. So when I started to do some side movement, I mean, at that time I didn't do too much, but I already felt like this is very, um, it's not very sturdy and very stable. Yeah. I still have this pedal at home. I Sometimes still yeah, yeah. I still have it at home. I try it out, but it's just... Uh, a pain in the ass a little bit that you cannot adjust the beater. It's just fixed in this oh, position. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you get a lot of punch out of it, and uh, it was nice to start with it. But I would recommend Iron Cobra. Iron Cobra. Okay, great. Which double bass pedal are you using right now? Charge Capita. As you, <laughs> if you don't <laughs> you know, yet, know yeah. now you know. <laughs> <laughs> the Polish tank. The okay, Polish tank. direct drive pedal. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's shortly talk about your pedal settings right now. But that I mean spring tension, beta angle and beta weight. Do you use heavier beaters or like lighter beaters? Um, spring tension, I would probably always go, doesn't matter which pedal I have, I would go for medium to high. Mm -hmm. Too high makes, for me, it makes it difficult to play mid-tempo to slow stuff mm -hmm. because the pedal wants to push back all the time and you will lose a lot of force by just controlling the pedal. Mm -hmm. The rebound helps you though on the other side to play fast. That's why I recommend something in the middle. So you have the advantage while playing fast. The beater comes faster back. You have a little bit of uh, help from the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, not too much. Uh, so and on my Chacha computer it's on seventh position right now. Mm -hmm. It's like more than 45 degrees beater angle. Oh yes. Like this is the bass drum heads. Yeah, beater. I put also the beater back. Okay, so further back. Further yeah. back, um, I used to have it a bit closer. You have then some sort of indicator on the top. Mm. Um, I used to put it back one step. Now I'm at one and a half to two. Depends how I feel, but now I actually like the two position. Mm. It's just okay. way more punch, um, a bit less speed, but it, the volume is completely different. Okay, yeah. And beater, many years I've played Iron Cobra beaters, uh, but I had some issues with them like mm -hmm. metal was breaking mm -hmm. and I need something to rely on when I play live shows. I, I, it cannot happen that beater. It should not happen. Should not happen yeah. So if I can avoid it, that's why I give the original beaters a try. At first, honestly, I was afraid that I will break a lot of skins with this heavy beater. So I avoided it. Yeah. But the opposite is the case. I break less skins with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's heavier, gives it a more of a smack sound. Um, okay. Yeah. And, um, it's actually a cool beat there. You just cannot get it too far out because then the weight is ridiculous. It's okay, okay. So you have to find the right setting with it. But otherwise, now I definitely would go for the heavy beaters. Of charge your copy to there. Yes, the heavy charge. Gotcha. Right. Okay, great. Next one. 
What sticks do you use and do you prefer lighter or heavier sticks in general? I prefer heavier sticks. Mm -hmm. I go heavier and heavier as I get older for yeah. some weird reason. <laughs> I remember starting out with Mike Portnoy promo sticks. Really? Toothpicks. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, you know. <laughs> then eventually I changed to some weird combinations out of uh, 5B with a round tip. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt like they have a nice rebound, but they destroyed the skins very easy. Mm -hmm. Then I had two Bs. I felt like they're a bit too short and now and too light especially when you put tape on and I put tape on right mm -hmm. now yeah the weight shifts ah, yeah. the weight shifts I kind of like when the they're heavy in the front mm -hmm. I don't like it when it's too uh, like too light yeah uh, and so when I put the tape on on my the sticks I used before I was like hmm, I don't know I have the grip but I just have to push way more than I want to mm -hmm. let's give even a bigger one, like a, even a thicker one, I try. Okay. And now I ended up on the Promark 419, which is okay. that's the series, what it's called. It is a bit longer and a bit thicker than a 2B, mm -hmm. so you can reach further stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it has more weight. And then I put also the tape on it, which means you have like a tree in your hand. <laughs> it's good for your self confidence. Yeah. Like when you go on stage, I had the feeling with like thin sticks. I have to hold them even harder to not lose them. Mm -hmm. And with this tape, it's just like, okay, you have this thing in your hand, like, okay, I can hold on to them. Okay, okay. Uh, what kind of tape do you use right now for the drumstick? Uh, this is actually a cheap overgrip tape for uh, tennis rackets. Uh, for tennis racket, okay. You know, I buy, uh, I tell you the truth, for me, normal sticks tape is very expensive. If I would imagine, like, especially if you would play even more with Rimshot, it would be too expensive mm -hmm. you know i'm still in this league of drama where you you have to buy your things especially sticks you know that's yeah. the truth mm -hmm. so um i tried to find the alternative mm -hmm. and um, you can buy a very cheap overgrid tape like 60 pieces at once mm -hmm. and I, I i cut it in half like one overgrid tape is for one pair ah okay like well, this. one pair of sticks yeah, okay so 60 tapes means 60 sticks mm -hmm. great Next one. Do you trigger your bass drum and if so, which triggers are you using? Yes, of course, I, I trigger my kick drums and I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't feel ashamed of it um, because it's a necessary tool and discussions about it are just making everybody, every metal drummer tired. And, mm. um, so yes, I do use them, of course, mainly live and I really like roll-on triggers because mm. they have always worked. I used in the past, in my early days, I had a couple of D-drum triggers and they always broke. Uh, the red shot? The red mm -hmm. shot. There mm -hmm. was always a misfunction with the cable, like with the connection inside. Okay. I don't know why. For me, it made more sense that they're more durable because they were made out of metal. So metal is harder, right? Mm -hmm. But the electronics, I don't know, maybe I was just unlucky. Mm -hmm. But I still have my first triggers from Roland and they survived. I don't know how many hundred shows and years of touring. Okay. And a good tip for your triggers is um, how to to store them properly is just take a, a Tupperware, a mm -hmm. thin one, yeah. put them inside with a little bit of foam. It's like a hard case for uh, triggers. triggers. I still have the same this the same uh, box from the beginning on, and it's the same triggers inside, and they're not even broken ones. Yeah, great. So Great tip. It's <laughs> uh, something worth to check out. <laughs> Which grip are you using when playing fast single strokes with your hands? Fast single strokes. You mean where the thumb is? Yeah. It switches depending on my hand. Can I say it like this? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because it does actually. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that it's like something like this. I don't go mm -hmm. fully. What okay, is it? The no, French or which that's, is the that's German grip? Yeah, and that's the French. That's the French grip, and in between is some kind of American grip. I think I'm more on the American side. Mm -hmm. But there, <laughs> <laughs> this. Yeah. <laughs> so um, and it really depends. Uh, before we did this workout, and I I felt like when I had to play it loud and some kind of triplet feeling. I had the thumb on the on the top, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but it's like this rotation going on in the wrist. Yeah. 
So I tried to get the maximum out of it and I felt like, okay, try to play a lot from the wrist and control a little bit with the fingers, push it if necessary. Uh -huh. And um, so it's in between. And what I do is with my left hand, um, because at blast beats you want to have a loud snare, so I try to push really. As I do like you do some sort of rotation. You have a system. Yeah. I do it more to use a little bit of different muscles here and yeah. there. Yeah. So it depends, the wrist, the elbow, or even an up and down motion. Mm -hmm. Also, okay. Yeah. Double bass foot technique at slow and mid tempos. Are you using a mix of hip flexors and calf muscles or is it just hip flexors at tempos from 1 to 170 beats per minute? No, it definitely is a mix and it's a change also depending on the tempo, right? Mm -hmm. Slower tempos, I play more from the hip flexor, it's more of a stomping motion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was around 130 already where I started to incorporate a bit more of the, the, the calf muscle. The calf yeah. muscle yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this area around 140, I try to get more out of the, the calf muscle and the ankle motion. It's more comfortable than the stomping motion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, I get more power out of from the full leg, but it it's depends on, on the speed really. And that's why I change. So it's, it's going to be a mix at a certain tempo. Up um, above this tempo, yeah. it's going to be only the calf. Only the calf muscle. Okay. Yeah. And if you play faster than 170 BPM, is 170 BPM the point where you switch to the swivel technique consciously or unconsciously? Consciously when it's especially a long part. If it's a long double kick pattern straight going through like a, you know some sort of tractor tuk -tuk 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 -tuk, all the yeah. time, then I would switch to the swivel technique with the thought that I don't have to, like I will not cramp up and mm -hmm. I can play longer and louder. I can pull off this tempo without the swivel technique, but on the long term... Okay, yeah. but that's an interesting point. You could, like for example, let's say at 180 or 190, if it's for a short period of time, you can play regular heel up using your calf muscles as well. So you yeah, don't yeah. have to like switch totally to the swivel technique. No, 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 time. it's not necessary. The swivel technique here it just helps me to really play very long patterns. When you mm -hmm. look at some power metal drummers, where there's constantly the 16 notes kicks running mm -hmm. through. That's actually a good exercise to do. Just take some power metal, speed metal stuff, which is a bit like, which is lower than 200, but mm -hmm. most of the songs are like this. Or Motorhead songs, great mid-tempo workout. Mm -hmm. All the time double kick, play it. Yeah. Five minutes through, you can, it's gonna burn, but it's exactly a good exercise. Great. So yes, I can play it without the swivel mm -hmm. too, but uh, because I, I know this technique and it's just, I need less energy, I will definitely go for it. Go for it. Okay. Okay, about the swivel technique, let's dissect it a bit. Your right foot for the first stroke with the swivel technique, do your, is your ankle moving out to the right side or in to the left side? Right foot, stronger foot, so he does the first hit, first of all, to mention that, and then what he does, um, he swings in, for some kind of the first whip, but there is no hit happening. So he kind of takes the movement, mm -hmm. like whoop, and then you go on the, on the outside in my case, so I, I push right, and this is where the first stroke happens. Okay, okay, and for the left foot, the same? No, left foot is not going out, the left foot does the opposite, he actually goes in, so you have like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's kind of following him, like, what the right does. What yeah. the right does, rather than, you know, like, if the right goes out, you think, okay, the left one has to also go out. There is this option. There are drummers that do like this. Mm -hmm. I think even the majority is doing like that. Yep. Probably even George does, George Colias and Ken also does this. Like Ken? That. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay. But somehow this is what developed with me. It made more sense mm -hmm. and it felt like, ah, okay, I can learn this movement faster, this wave mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works out fine for you. So. It works fine. Uh, it would be tricky for me now to, to switch this because it just mm. saved in my head. Yeah, muscle memory. It's muscle like memory like crazy. Mm, yeah. <laughs> All right. One more question about the foot technique. When you start and stop a bass drum pattern, do you press your bass drum beater against the bass drum head or do you stop right before the bass drum head? 
Um, I had to do this with like behemoth stuff mm -hmm. because Inferno's playing for me was like almost like a machine gun you know the trigger has to be all the time ready and then it shoots out a million bullets per second <laughs> yeah. while compared to Decapitated it was like a lot of longer periods of time double kick and not so fast and there it was like you could probably play a drum fill which helps you go into the double kick pattern mm -hmm. So I remember a certain parts in Behemoth song, I had to look at my left foot and just push against the beat, like against the pedal. So mm -hmm. the beater touches already the skin to have the first hit that there is some sort of pretend, like some tension already there in the spring. Ah, okay. To start the pattern, this quick pattern better. But usually I don't rest the beater there. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do is now, uh, it kind of moves close. Mm -hmm like to get the pretension, yeah. but it doesn't touch it actually. Ah, okay. So it's like, tuck. And then you <laughs> start playing, okay. Double bass practice. Do you ever get fatigued and tired? And if so, do you take days off of drumming? Yes, I do. Um, it's important for me and I think it's important for everybody to also know your limits. And when your body screams for some break, mm -hmm. you should definitely give him the break. Or do something else. You can be still active. It also it's also a good idea to maybe skip drumming for one day, but you, mm -hmm. you do some sports, you know, just do other things like be still active, but you use different muscles and actually let the drumming muscles rest a bit. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, so I also get tired, and um, when I have those days, sometimes I go ten minutes in the room, and I feel like it's really crap, and then I, I leave. You leave, and uh, regarding activities that don't involve drumming do you which kind of sport do you do mm, a mix of different things i i do like running but i get i get bored if it's too long yeah so the distances are under 10 kilometers so 10 okay. would be the maximum uh, i usually like to go run a bit faster around five kilometers just mm -hmm. to have more the pulse of playing faster stuff mm -hmm. yeah. to kind of simu like simulate it mm -hmm. Um, this is what I like to do. I really like mountain biking because again, you have the, those peaks and yeah. like, you know, some interval in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we talk about power, like about weights, I just use my body weight. I, I'm, I'm not fitness center guy who is going to lift some weights. Yeah, you're not in the gym. No, a gym is for me not, I know people need it. Some of them need it to be motivated. Mm -hmm. To do something but to me it works the other way around i prefer to i have the drive to do it mm -hmm. and i want my peace and i learned that or for me the theory is uh, if i use my body weight mm -hmm. the body will only grow to this point muscle mass that it's not limiting you so, you know ah, okay and the exercise you do is like regular push-ups pull-ups yes maybe dips exactly and then uh, make it harder sometimes if you do some um what are they called okay boy a squats, yeah. Squats, my yeah. friends, how could I forget? <laughs> so, if I do squats, uh, mostly I do it with one leg on a ah. like a shaky surface mm -hmm. to get all the small muscles going, which is great to stabilize you while you play drums, especially yeah. with the swivel technique. Certain things like this just make those exercises a bit harder. Okay. But still, you have your body weight, but you will see, you know, sur uh, shaky ba uh, surface and mm -hmm. it's much harder. Okay. Yeah, that's what you do. Great. Next question. Now we're going to talk about career advice and practice sessions on tour. Kerim, you're working as a full-time musician. How do you manage to stay in shape at the drum kit when you are on tour? And also, how often do you practice per week when you are not on tour? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's two different worlds. Mm -hmm. Being on tour, my main goal is to play a good show. So mm -hmm. the whole day uh, is basically focused on this set, like if it's an hour or longer or short, it doesn't matter. So I want to save the power for this moment just to give everything there. But sometimes you feel, especially when you have no days off and it's like constantly playing every day and you're getting more and more tired. Mm -hmm. I do sometimes do some sort of sports, like in a way that I go running a little bit. I'm not talking about what we mentioned before, like five kilometers with higher speed, no, just really to 
loosen up or I do some stretching exercises. Another great thing is uh, I use this black roll, like, um, mm -hmm. yeah. so all your, uh, how to say, trigger points mm -hmm. loosen up. Yeah. And um, so it's rather like maintaining a healthy body, mm -hmm. um, not really a workout too much because I had the experience if I do some like power workout in the morning, my power workout is basically loading in. You know, if you <laughs> yeah, again, loading up. <laughs> lift all those heavy things. I mean, you have to have you have to be careful to not destroy your back. Mm -hmm. But if you're the person like I am, which is from the beginning, like when the doors open the venue, like 10 in the morning, 11 in the morning, I'm the guy that will be till the end, till Luda that will be there. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, it's my exercise, lifting those heavy cases, yep. setting up the drums. Um, you know, I like to do everything that's, uh, somehow. It's interesting for me. I'm not only the drummer, I do more than that. So I would consider, yeah, load in, load out, some sort of strength workout, because it is. And, uh, but if I would do something more, probably I would feel it at the evening. It doesn't help okay. for me. Mm -hmm. So it's rather than, okay, I need some stretch, I need to loosen up, go a little bit running. Okay, that's it. And what about practicing on tour? Practicing on tour, I don't really do because I play every day anyways. Mm. Um, I do some warm up, but I would never sit down while I'm on tour and try to learn other things like other songs or something. No, okay. No, okay. I just focus. Really, I focus on the show and try to be consistent every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and the other question: How often do you practice when you are not on tour? Again, depending on uh, how much things I have to do. Sometimes I have no time to to play drums because there's simple other things to do or you know traveling or pff, I don't know there's always other things to do besides drumming but I try to let's say we have seven days I want to have at least four days to five days I want to play and I usually play two maximum three hours um, per day. yeah per day not more mm -hmm. first of all I don't have the time and I don't have the focus anymore Mm -hmm. If you concentrate it for even one hour and you just play uh, with 100% focus, you will get more out of it than like spending eight, eight hours at the practice room and just like play a little bit, be frustrated, you know, mm -hmm. like overwork. No, it's yeah. better like, you know. This yeah, way. I totally agree. Yeah. So actually, before you enter the rehearsal room, you already know what you're doing, what you're going to practice that day? Mm. Yes and no. I mean... Mm -hmm. If I have a tour coming up or a show, the chances are like 99.9% .9 that I will go through the set. Mm -hmm. Just to be, to have a routine and muscle memory and also self-confidence when I go on stage. I hate it when I, I had no time to really go this, uh, to play the set on my own yeah. before we go on stage. I mean, a day before. Mm -hmm. So even though if I would be tired, I would at least do it just for safety that my brain is sure and my muscles are sure tomorrow on stage, even if you're tired, you will be able to play it. Mm -hmm. You can feel more confident. Um, so this is what I will do most of the time. Besides that, um, if I have nothing to learn, like let's say no session shop, we don't have any shows with septic flesh. Uh, I do whatever I want to. Sometimes I would throw in like, okay, I want to focus a little bit more on the kicks today. Check if they're clean enough played or mm -hmm. do some mini workout. Um, or then it would be a groove exercise by just playing to some funk beats like Spotify playlist, yeah. hip hop songs from the 80s and 90s and just play to this, whatever comes to my mind. It sucks probably most of the time because I'm not used to this, but I have this motivation to grow in these areas. Mm -hmm. So those are the moments where I don't know what I will do. It mm -hmm. happens in the practice room. I'm, okay. not, I'm not too strict with like, this has to be today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next one, how do you warm up in a live situation? Hands and feet. Important topic and a thing I'm like searching for the right answer for so long. It has changed a lot during the years from uh, trying to do some dry warm up without the pedal and like with practice pads, but it never was like I felt Anyways, I need four songs to, to be ready. Mm -hmm. So after the like, fifth song, I'm like, okay, now this, the show can start. So what I've done on the last US tour, I was just going for a run, believe it or not, but before every show, okay. um, the, the previous band would play and I know, okay, this is the last two songs. 
I would just get up in like my drumming shorts. It would be minus, I don't know, five degrees out there, but I didn't care. Mm -hmm. Take the hoodie mm -hmm. and I would run around the block like for five minutes, just to the point where I feel like, okay, my brain starts to get more oxygen, more blood. Yeah. Um, my heart is, you know, starting to pump more blood mm -hmm. in the whole body and I start to sweat. This is the moment where I usually come in. And then when you go in the warm uh, backstage area or in the club, you feel all of a sudden how your whole body is like pulsating yeah. with blood. And so this is a really good workout or not workout, a good warm up for me to just get ready, like with my whole body. Mm -hmm. And I've had like even double, double kick patterns work easier with, with less problems. Okay. I would still recommend to just do some coordination exercises, even if we do the hand or feet. But mm -hmm. the running thing and a couple of push-ups and jumps just to, to get your whole body ready for the, for the work you're about to do. Yeah. Because it's very physical work. Yeah, okay, you use small muscles too. You have to have this sensitivity. You cannot ruin it by heavy weight or like heavy workout. Mm -hmm. But you still have to be ready. You know, you have to... I had the feeling that um, also my mind is coming down. Oh, okay. You know, you're nervous. You're like, okay, there are like a couple of thousand people out there if it's a big show. And you know you can do it, but I don't know. You have this tension. And when I usually go running, the fresh air, the oxygen, you just like... You calm down, mm -hmm. it's quiet, the quiet before the storm. Yeah, yeah. I put in earplugs, I don't hear anything. So okay. I just run around some sort of meditation, a quick, you know, think about what's gonna happen next, you know, focus on what you have to do, warm up and then destroy. <laughs> then destroy, perfect. Now I want to talk about your career, like from nine years ago or eight years ago till now. You've been playing drums for Decapitated. Then you filled in for Behemoth and now you're a permanent member of Septic Flesh. What are the big differences between those three bands for you drumming wise? There are a couple of differences. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Musically and drumming wise too. Uh, so far, all of those bands, I've always kind of took over a role from my previous drummer. You know, it was mm -hmm. like never that I started a band uh, from zero. Yeah. So that's what they have in common. But um, yeah, with Decapitated, it is very much like you have those four people on stage and you have to slay with your skill and with the groove you have and with mm -hmm. the, there's no theatrical show behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cargo yeah. shorts, whatever t-shirt, it doesn't matter, but you have, to, you have to play super tight, which was always the main focus. Mm -hmm. We would have practiced all the time before every show, we'd practice a couple of days before and sometimes play songs very slow and make sure that we are like this, pop! Okay. Guitar, bass, vocals and drums. And it was like a train hitting you. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, the main focus with Decapitated was really like on your playing skills mm -hmm. rather than the show. Yeah. With Behemoth, it was very difficult in a short period of time to get used to this, I would say, more old school drumming. You know, I'm, when you look at Inferno, he's an amazing drummer and he pulls it off. I don't know how he does it because when I look at him, his technique is something I would probably never do. It's like mm -hmm. completely different. Close your eyes and it's so tight. Yeah. Open it and you're like, how, why? But it <laughs> yeah. works. It works fine, yeah. So to squeeze in in the, his style of playing and play those beats was way more complicated than I thought. How many days did you have to prepare for the Behemoth gig? Uh, 10 songs, uh, not 10 songs, 10 days it was. Yeah. But we started earlier, so I would say a week. A week for 14 songs <laughs> yeah and when I remember the day when he called or Ryan called me I was just like you know playing some softer music before I did a session job which was um, some rock melodic rock stuff yeah. so okay. no blast beat no double kicks nothing yeah. so I was like okay okay now I have to get my speed back in this short time which mm -hmm. was crazy um, so I had to really fight with this old school drumming a bit um, and so this was the, the biggest difference like to what I would usually do is yeah. very old school drumming and with septic flesh I feel it is the closest to the drummer I want to be mm -hmm. when I when I learned the, the drum parts from Fortis and it just felt very natural I would yeah. say that his way of choosing the drum beats or it felt way more natural I could learn and quicker mm -hmm. uh, so because it has 
uh, some groovy parts, it has some fast parts, it's a like combination of everything. And also Behemoth and Septic Flesh, they're a more threat theatrical show. So it's not only that you have to play tight, yes, but there's this thing like how you present yourself on stage, you wear outfits, you wear corpse paint, sometimes there's fire with Behemoth, Septic Flesh not, but still, you know, there's a, a different attitude. Yeah. A show, more of a show. More of a show, yeah. yeah. Okay, time management. How are you able to manage playing live for Septic Flesh, recording solo albums constantly, being active on social media, on a daily basis, you're very active, all while still doing session shops as well. So I think your daily schedule is pretty packed and full. Mm -hmm. So explain to us how you do it. It is very full, yes. And how I do it, yeah, a lot of it is self-made. Like I have the drive in me to to do things I hate the most to be, no, how does it like, I'm, I would wish to be bored mm -hmm. because I haven't had it for so long <laughs> that I miss the feeling of being bored mm -hmm. because it never happens. I don't know how people can watch Netflix because I have no time for Netflix mm -hmm. or TV. Yeah. Because I wake up in the morning and just there are a hundred things that are running through my head what I have to do. From like, okay, I want to go practice. So this is probably the first thing in the morning. So I go play, pray, I play for a couple of hours. Then I come back home. Then there's a life besides drumming too. You know, you have to cook yourself something. You have to go to the store. You have to buy some food. While these emails are coming in, mm -hmm. um, maybe upload a video for what you just recorded in the practice room for social media. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes even before practicing, I would check if there is an order of my solo project, like uh, yeah. CDs and mm -hmm. stuff. So I would go first to the post office, then practice, then home, eat, do all the emails. Afternoon would be probably things like uh, cutting a video if necessary, edit a mm -hmm. video, or trying to do something with songwriting. Mm -hmm. Not so much playing drums, rather than all the other things, emails, septic flash stuff, these are things, um, yeah, this kind of stuff. Also, a lot of things I don't post, which you don't see, but I'm constantly doing something till the evening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tricky, and I have those moments, especially this summer, was there was so much things going on, like one session shop after another, or a different band wants something, and then Septic Flash, and now we start working on a new album, that I find it difficult to do things simultaneously on the guy that that wants it one after another. Mm -hmm. So I try to plan it in this way, like, okay, I will do it for you, but I need still a week to do this, and then I will focus on your stuff. If somebody uh, asks me yeah. to do session shop. Okay, so you, you got your priorities straight up, you got your time schedule for the next couple of days, so yeah. you know what you're gonna do and you're gonna focus on. Yes. And if I offer you a job, for example, as a session grammar, you would tell me, okay, in two weeks from now, I've got time for that, but not now. Correct. Okay. I would say like, look, I have this still going on, mm -hmm. um, especially now, like I just did a recording session and there was the next one waiting and I had to say, like, okay, let me finish this first because I want to make the job 100% mm -hmm. and I want to focus on your songs and maybe like change certain parts, which means I need to listen to the songs, I need to play through them, give it some time mm -hmm. and adjust. This is what I want. Okay. And then I'm sure that I make a good job. So. And usually people don't have such a stress, they can wait. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a person that wants to do things, I want to have things done. Mm -hmm. So don't worry, I will push myself anyways yeah. all the time. This is what you need, you need to have a drive. But I tell you, at certain moments, with this whole social media, it is at a point where I would, would actually love to throw the phone against the wall mm -hmm. and I would wish it's not there. But I know it has to be done and I know it's part of what we do. Mm -hmm. And especially nowadays, uh, if you want to be a drama that everybody knows or not everybody knows that you stay in the business you have to do it but believe me if I would have a choice if it would work without it I would love to not be active on mm. because I lose a lot of time with this um, you know time I could spend with friends and family or doing other things or be bored you know? or be bored <laughs> yeah. all right what advice would you give someone who wants to join a bigger band just like you did um, you have to earn respect and what I mean is this is something that takes years and I also realized how this business works you have to always try to do your job as good as you can even if you have problems with other people in the business try to be as 
you know, correct as you can and mm -hmm. try to don't piss on anyone's leg mm -hmm. because it will always backfire. And people will talk about you in the business. So if you do your job good, you know, I, I got the call from Behemoth for a reason because we played a tour together mm -hmm. in 2010. Uh, and then 2013, they called me because they remember like how I played, how I acted, what I did. They saw that I'm someone who uh, tries to do his job as good as, as he can. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not the party guy. I will always focus on what has to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, so people are talking and that's what I, what I would give you an advice is to don't have a headliner attitude because you just joined a big band. You should never have it, in my opinion, even if you're a huge band. For example, one of my biggest, like for me, one of the biggest bands right now is uh, Meshuggah, for example. Mm -hmm. And those are the most loveliest guys you can imagine. When we did a tour together, we were decapitated. And Meshuggah, I was, I was surprised how chill those people are mm -hmm. uh, and human beings. Um, of course, you have to treat them with respect and stuff, but I just like that they are normal people. And this is what I would totally advise you. You have to build up a respect. You know, what if this with this one band, it doesn't work out? Would you want to have another band? Yeah, but if, you, if you're this headliner guy or would be drunk all the time or, you know, just doesn't do his job right, the chances will be very high that he will not find anything because mm -hmm. it's already difficult. Yeah, yeah it's, already it's very difficult mm -hmm. to keep what you have and to but for me respect was always the most important mm -hmm. even if there are some people who are like ah, okay this guy is shady business or but i tried to still you know maybe stay away but have a respect second to last question what are your plans like gigs tours studio sessions and youtube videos for the rest of 2018 tour wise there is no tour mm -hmm. so we have probably one or two shows coming up with septic flash for sure one about the other one i don't know because with septic flash the, uh, the main focus is right now writing a new album mm -hmm. we just switched a new label we, we switched to nuclear blast and this would be the first album on this label mm -hmm. so we want to make sure that it's even better than the one before so we took the time off to write ideas so this is what I will have to do now. Uh, besides that, I have uh, two drum clinics coming up. Okay, when and where? Uh, one in Poland on the 11th of uh, November mm -hmm. in Schlansk, in Chorzów. It is sponsored by Meindl. <laughs> okay. So there's a, a bunch of cool Meindl drummers there. Uh, and the other one is going to be on the, if I'm, if I'm correct, 25th of November, mm -hmm. also November, in Romania again with a couple of cool other drummers uh, so if you're in this area please feel feel free to come here it would be great mm -hmm. uh, so this is something we'll have to focus on session shop wise there's another thing happening like i have to start now to to record some songs for a friend of mine mm -hmm. um, i don't know if i will have time to do my own solo project like more stuff yeah probably not because if i want to be creative with septic flesh i remember it was it was great, but also very time consuming and exhausting. And now you have to be even more picky with the ideas. So yeah. you cannot just like write a riff and think, OK, this is the final one. You know, two days later, you're like, oh, this is shit. It needs to be new. So I want to have no shows in a way. OK, here at Drum Clinic and stuff, but we have to do the album. Mm -hmm. The majority of the album will be done now. That's why. OK, yeah. that's the main focus. Yeah. And then uh, we will probably start with some tours in January. We'll see. Okay. But till end of 2018, that's the plan. That's the plan. Okay. Be finally at home, you know, also. <laughs> uh, YouTube videos. Yes, I want to do some YouTube videos. I have done a couple in the last month, which are not released yet. Mm -hmm. Just wait. Which wait. ones? No, not covers. Tell us. No, no, okay. not covers. It's, sorry, no covers. <laughs> um, no, it's just some, some stuff I did with some friends. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be some faster stuff. So I'm waiting for for their final mix and just uh, three days ago or so I did some drum tour video which I'm editing right now which we split it in three parts where drum nerd like crazy I just talk about everything like what drums I use why skins pedals uh, sticks cymbals ah, okay. so it's like 20 minutes 
something like this each video mm -hmm. super nerdy talk no playing but talk <laughs> but talking okay great so Kerim thank you very much for being here at the Drum Technique podcast thank you. now it's time to say goodbye your final words for our audience first of all to you thank you for the invitation I have thank to say you. and also I'm really really happy that there's another drummer from Austria who achieved you know, a big thing because your course is great and I see the response it has. So I want to say first thanks to you and thanks for the invitation. Um, and for my fans, thanks for watching and you should definitely uh, never give up playing or like try to always find some inspiration in what you do. Even if it's like, ah, okay, I don't want to play fast stuff anymore. Go in a different direction. Be hungry, be patient and work hard. This is usually what leads you for some success. Well, great final words. Thank you for that. All right, guys, that's it for today. Have a great day. Cheers from Vienna. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye.